Um, I, I heard a story, or read a story this week that was actually a really old story. It was about 70 years old. It happened back in 1952. But um, I thought it was pretty incredible um, about a, a bus driver in London whose name was Albert Gunter. And it was just a uh, normal, he's on his normal Route 78 going through London back in December of 1952. <laughs> and um, he, uh, he was headed towards the, the Tower Bridge, which, now some people think this is the London Bridge that was falling down, but that's a different bridge. Um, but famous in its own right, it's a drawbridge. And normally um, this, this drawbridge was set up so that, you know, when, when people would, or when drivers would come to it, if the, if the bridge was going up, there was a signal light and a, and a guard there to make sure that traffic didn't go on the bridge. But for whatever reason, that day it was not working. And uh, so here he is, he's driving this double-decker bus and he's on the bridge and he realizes that it's going up while he's on it. And it is too late to like step on the brakes and so, in a split-second decision, he steps on the accelerator, and, you know, now that's a recreation, this is not the actual thing here, but he, he takes off and he makes the leap and he actually lands it on the other side with only minor injuries, so that's him there kind of recreating what, what happened, uh, but yeah, only minor injuries, landed that thing, they, they paid him an extra 10 pounds <laughs> and gave him the day off. That was his, his reward. But also, he kind of just entered into uh, uh, history with, with that. So I thought that was, was pretty bold and, uh, and pretty amazing. And, you know, it wasn't like he was trying to do something bold. He wasn't setting out to do something new or creative or, you know, really extra daring. He just was doing what needed to be done in that moment. And it happened to be uh, a bold thing. And as we're looking at the church, as it's unfolding in the, in the book of Acts, as it is continuing to emerge this new thing that's, that's never really existed before, um, they weren't really setting out to be groundbreaking or do something totally radical or new, but it ended up being something really bold that they had to do. And I want to look at that with you today. For, for people who may not have been here last week, can anybody just give us a quick recap on where we left off last week in the book of Acts? What was, what was happening? Anybody remember? Come on, you guys. You need to give us a warning before you do that. I know. It's a, it's a whole week back there. What did we talk about last week? Anybody remember the story from last week? What were we, what was it about? <laughs> Silver and gold have I none. Come on. Yes. Right. See, I knew you guys had it in you. Yes, the, the beggar that was sitting at the gate that got healed. See, you, it's right there. Steel traps. You guys are sharp. Um, so, yeah, so the beggar at the gate gets healed and he goes through and he's, he's walking and leaping and praising God. Just this incredibly awesome miracle, right? And, and we talked a little bit about how that opened up these opportunities right there that day for Peter to preach to two different groups about the gospel. And um, so we're going to pick up right where that story left off. What happened was the second group that he was speaking to was a group of really the, um, the religious authorities, the, the teachers, the priests, the, the leadership. And they, uh, they after, after this all happened, they weren't really sure what to do with what was going on. And so they, they threw Peter and John in jail overnight and were like, ah, let's deal with this in the morning. So the next day, this is, this is where we pick up and, and what happened the next day. 
It says, when they saw the boldness, they being these leaders, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they hadn't gotten any religious training, they marveled and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing there with them, they had nothing to say in response. So they ordered them to leave the Sanhedrin, that's their, their council, to leave the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What should we do with these men, they asked. It's clear to everyone living in Jerusalem that a remarkable miracle has occurred through them, and we cannot deny it. But to keep this message from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them not to speak to anyone in, his, in, his, in this name. You know this is going to go well. Uh, so then they called them in again and commanded them. And that's a really strong, strict word of instruction here, given with uh, a certain amount of authority. Commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to listen to you rather than God. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not find a way to punish them because all the people were glorifying God for what had happened. Or, you know, where's the crime here? For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. I mean, that's old, that's old right? Over 40. On their release, Peter and John returned to their own people. That's a really um, intimate word there of their really near and dear, close people who knew them best and loved them. Uh, they went to their own people and reported everything that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When the believers heard this, they lifted up their voices to God with one accord. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. And here they quote from Psalm 2. They said, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. And they said, in fact, this is the very city where Herod and Pontius Pilate conspired with the Gentiles and the people of Israel against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. They carried out what your hand and will had decided beforehand would happen. So they're, they're looking at what happened to Jesus and saying that's what was prophesied in, in Psalms. And now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with complete boldness. As you stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place they were, where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God boldly. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. Now, typically in this little section here, I've kind of just seen this as mostly a, a transition passage getting us from the story about the man who was healed to chapter five. And, and that um, I really didn't give it a lot of thought or, or pay it a lot of attention, honestly. Um, and part of that is, you know, when we, when we read about the chief priests, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the elders, of that whole group of these religious leaders we kind of we kind of written them off, right? I mean, when we've read enough about them that we kind of when they show up, we know where they're going. We we know what they're like, and that there's always going to be the opposition, and so we kind of just skip over it and go, well, of course, that's how they were going to react to what's going on here. And I was thinking more about how this must have felt to Peter and John in that moment and going, I think this was a bigger deal to them than uh, because, because it's, 
it's representing something uh, really, really significant here because, you know, in, in just the last story, Peter, Peter and John are going up to the temple at the time of prayer, right? So that tells us that they, they were just continuing on with their, with their same patterns of worship. They had every intention of, of continuing to be part of this same worshiping community. They didn't see it as being in conflict with this, this new faith in Christ that they had. They saw it as all going together. Uh, and, and their growing up experience, their whole community, the way that they understood their, their faith, these people who are, are now at odds with them, are the people who are the representatives of God. Like they are, there's a weight to them coming in with their opposition at this point um, because it still feels like they're speaking for the law. They're speaking for God's will in a sense. Even, even though they've seen Jesus have conflict with these people, there's still that element in which this is the voice of their faith community. And I thought about that, that discomfort that must have been there for them, that sense of uh, turmoil and, and tension that was there. And I think uh, what it says to me is that there can be tension between following Christ and our religious traditions. And I don't know about you, but it feels to me like over the last couple of years, uh, there's been a lot of tension between following Jesus and figuring out our place in the larger faith community. I don't know if you felt that. I talked to lots of people who are struggling going, I don't know if I'm on the same page with what's happening. I know for myself as, as a pastor, um, I'll be really candid. This has been a really challenging season to be a, a recognized professional uh, representative of church when so much of what you see out in the world of what the church in general looks like can be so ugly and so divisive. And you go, okay, there's there can be this tension when it feels like the people who are representing the church uh, are saying something that feels also at odds. Can you relate to that? Does anybody, uh, that feels like a very widespread sentiment that we're going, what's happening here? And, um, and that, that sometimes what we see feels like it's not in character with Christ. And we go, well, I, I, I hold this belief, but I don't, I don't really know that I agree with the tactics or I don't, it, it feels like it's created, there's been a lot of tension. And so I, to put it another way, I would say, uh, just because it's churchy doesn't mean it's right. Because <laughs> um, there's a whole lot of nonsense that happens in the name of Christ that isn't really of Christ. And, and, uh, and at the same time, there's a, there's a corollary to that I think that's important. And that's just because it's not right doesn't mean I am. Just because it's causing tension for me, just because I'm feeling uncomfortable and trying to sort it out, doesn't mean that I'm necessarily in the right place either. Uh, Martin Luther, who was the great reformer back in the 1500s, you know, back in that time, all there was was the Catholic Church. It was the church. So they really had uh, authority, uh, a strong voice when they were talking for God, it, it wasn't like you have just, you can just, if you don't like one church, you just go to another today. Um, it was, it was the voice and Martin Luther, as he's, as he's going up against the leaders there and he's, he's trying to push for reformation. He didn't, he didn't want to go start a new church. His, his desire was really to bring change within. But, you know, you think about the pressure and the tension there between he and himself and the, the leadership. And, and here's what his comment was, what I, I thought was so good. He said, I'm more afraid of my own heart than of the Pope and all his cardinals. I have within me the great Pope self. 
And I think that's a really good word to remember as, as we wrestle with these things, as we figure out what it means to follow Christ in the middle, not only of feeling like we're in conflict with culture, but feeling like we're in conflict internally with, with the faith community, going, we gotta, we got to come at this with a, a certain degree of humility. Um, because... Because we're we're all susceptible to um, mistake and and uh, change, uh, you know, or, or or not not getting it right. So I'll just pause there for a minute. Any any burning comments before uh, before I continue? We only have until eleven o'clock. Right, right, right. Yes. So uh, we'll, we will keep we will keep it going. I know. Uh, I, but I know I know this is something that we're all we're all wrestling with. And, and let me just say as I'm I'm saying this, I, I want to also reassure you that I'm not I'm not introducing some like new change or direction that New Day is headed. Okay, um, I I want to tell you like my my theology is the same as it was when we started New Day. Like that has that has not shifted. I think. Hopefully, I have grown in it, and I understand it more. But but we're we're not we're not making a departure. We're not drifting some different direction. It's like rest assured, we're 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 not talking about that here. Okay, um, but I, I do feel like there is something that, as we've been going through this recent season, where there is there is just this sense of wondering. Are we all on the same page here? What's what's going on? And it can be it can be hard to sort that through. And I think this story actually can be helpful for us as as we're working through it. So I want to go back um, to to the story that we we looked at last week about this this man who was healed. And he come. That's the man who was healed, by the way. In case you're wondering, uh, he he uh, goes walking and leaping into the temple, and uh, this incredible miracle. And I just I'm wondering if you can have uh, some some one word characterizations or descriptions of what that event felt like, looked like to you. Any joy? Joy. Elation. Elation. Freedom. Freedom. Yes. Truth. Truth. Yes. He was seen. He was seen. Yes. Very much. Unexpected. Unexpected. Yep. So I, I kind of came up with some of the same words that you thought of there, of, of just what this represented. It had joy, it had freedom, there was care for this man, there was restoration to, to his full capacities. He was, he was being seen, he was being healed, this was fulfillment of prophecy. There was the wonder of the people around him, there was his own praise, and it was, it was life where there had been death, really. It's a resurrection kind of story and, and moment here. All of this is contained in what happened with that man. Okay, so now think about the, the reaction of these priests and teachers. Um, and think about how would you characterize their response to what they saw here? <laughs> Any words for that? Sorry, disdain? Uh-huh. Wait. Closed-mindedness. Closed-mindedness. Uh -huh. Fear. 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 Yep, a lot of fear. Threaten. Threaten. Yep. Yeah, you guys are, are right tracking with all the things that that I saw too. Anger, power, judgment, close-mindedness, disconnection, fear, authority, certainty. They really felt like they were in the right uh, threats and, and trying to control the situation. Really, that's what it came down to was ultimately wanting control over it. So if we think about this guy over here and all these things that were accompanying him and what was going on, and then you think about these, these people over here who are reacting to what they're seeing over there, and they're not sure what to do with it, and Peter and John tell them really clearly that the, the way they got to that thing was because of the cross, 
Uh, and they're very clear. They, they say there's, there's no name given under heaven by which we can be saved. This, this is it right here. It's, it's Jesus. You want these things over here. You want this that you see. It's because of Christ. That's, that's the path. And they can't get there. They're going, they, they just can't have the cross be true. That, that doesn't compute in their system. Their, their box can't allow for that. It would, it would mean too much for their own guilt, uh, their own being wrong before about Jesus. They, they cannot make that shift. And so because they cannot make that shift, they can't get to all that goodness with, oh, yeah. with somebody saying, were you saying something? Oh. <laughs> yeah, we were relating. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we, can't, we can't get there. And so it makes me think of Paul's words to, to Timothy, where he said, uh, you know, it's having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Because uh, they, they really did have a form of godliness. You look at their... They are, they are concerned about the right... These are, not, these are not evil people that we're talking about that are the, the religious leaders. They're, they just think they're right. They're not, they're not evil. They just think they're right. And, and they, uh, they, can't, they can't allow for the true source of the power of Jesus. And so... Uh, they're just left with this form of godliness. And so all they have then is all the things that go with maintaining that form of godliness. Um, and, you know, I remember a, a professor back in seminary saying, when we read these, these Bible stories, we, we always want to um, associate ourselves with the disciples in these stories. But he said, really, we should see ourselves in the Pharisees and the priests and the teachers of the law, because that's a lot of times who the story is directed at. And, and I look at this list, this circle, and I can go, oh yeah, I can operate out of those things a lot of the time where I'm, I'm trying to be concerned about rightness. I remember one time, Bill, uh, you told me that it felt like the situation I was in, that I was caught between being right and being present. And I always had thought it was between being right and being wrong. And I didn't realize there was another option there, that uh, this idea of being present. And these, these guys are not present. Notice they're, they're so disconnected. They're not even talking about this guy and this amazing thing that happened to him. They don't even care about that. It's, it's, it's trying to analyze it in this other category, and they can't do it. So all they're left with is this other stuff. I like this quote from uh, Dante Stewart that he posted this week. He said, many people don't leave Jesus or religion because they hate both. They leave because they realize how often we love theology more than people. That's, that's what's going on here. There's control more. We love control more than inclusivity, arrogance more than humility, assimilation more than freedom, and power more than love. And uh, they're not wrong, because sometimes that's, that's where we are at. Um, but I think, I think what it takes us to is realizing that the, the question really isn't who's right. Because it's very, it could have gotten very easy for the disciples as they are reacting to what's happening to them with these leaders to fall into the same things, right? And to, to react with the same anger and fear and all of that back at those feelings. And then it just gets back into, well, who's right? As our, and, and arguing back and forth. I don't think it's really about who's right. I think the question is, where's Jesus? Yes. And go, how do we stay focused on that? And if we can get to Christ and we can see where he is in the picture, the right is going to take care of itself. We don't need to be so fixated on, on that in that way. Um, so, so getting to the question of, of where is Jesus? I like what uh, Tim Keller said. He said, churches that are filled with self-righteous, exclusive, insecure, angry, moralistic people are extremely unattractive. Pharisees, and he's, he's calling 
church people that uh, Pharisees and their unattractive lives leave many people confused about the real nature of Christianity. And I would add to that, I think it sometimes means that, that we as the church can be confused about the real nature of, of Christianity. You know, because we get, we get caught thinking that it's about this form of godliness rather than about the power and rather than being about where Jesus is. Any, any questions or comments right there on, on that uh, thought before I move on? Yeah, Becky. I, I was just wondering about when the man was healed, he ran into the church, ran into the church? Yes. I thought that was meaningful. Yes. Yeah, that is meaningful, isn't it? That that he he ran toward praise and and worship, and then is is met by this um, skepticism and and cynicism about what's going on. But yeah, that's a really that's a really good good point there. Um, yeah, one more thing. I'm, yeah, I'm just thinking like when I hear a lot of people talk about um, faith, I I hear them say things like. Um, well, I want to be a good Christian. Yeah. You know, or um, just talking about, uh, you know, the things that we should do. Yeah. You know, with our faith. That's what faith is. I should go to church and read my right. Bible. Right. And, um, and, and it feels like that is kind of what we're talking about. Right. It's a form of godliness that denies the power. Right. Well, and really, when you think about it, when you go, if, if faith is what I'm doing... Then where's my faith? My faith is in then myself, right? It's not in God and what He's done. It's more like faith is just an invitation to work hard, and and that you know that and that's kind of where that's where these these leaders uh, were at. Um, and I think it, it makes me think of, of Jesus' words when when He said, you know, wisdom wisdom's proved right by all her children. So you look at you think of those two circles of, of words and you go the the path of choosing this, you know, focusing on what we're doing or being right in our thinking and our actions, and it ends up with that anger, fear circle, or in the name of Christ, the joy and the love, you know, like you see the fruit, you see the, the children of wisdom depending on, on the path that you take. So of course we wanna wanna figure out how to be on this this other path. So how do we how do we do this when we find ourselves still in the midst of faith community that's sorting this out, working through all this? Um, I think in this story we find just four I guess I would just say they're reminders. They're not any new concepts, but things that um, that are just good that can that can help us navigate our way. Because it is, it's confusing sometimes, and we're not sure how to make sense of all of it. And so I, I think what they um, what they did here kind of gives us a, a pathway. So first thing I would say is that we've got to keep tension. In perspective, the first thing I love where they started their prayer when they got back to their group, it says, uh, "Sovereign Lord," they said, "You made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them." All of a sudden, they just like move, pull themselves out of the the intensity of the moment and get clear back to this bird's eye perspective on everything and see see God for who He is. And see the world for what it is and God's relationship to the world, his ultimate control over everything. And, and they're able to um, step outside of all that's going on and, and reset and reaffirm um, who God is. And I think that is, is so critical when we're in the midst of, of these kinds of of. Tensions. We've got to we've got to keep it in perspective. Um, the second thing that I, I think we see for them is, is that we need to remember that the conflict is expected. You know, they uh, they immediately went to that verse in Psalms and and saw how David had foreseen what was going to happen with Jesus and the the leaders being. Uh, 
clashing with him. And then they applied it to their own situation. They said this, this, this relates to us as well. And so going, okay, none of this that's happening is a surprise to God. Um, and I think especially right now when, when, when the world just feels so new and different and, and church feels like in the last couple of years it's just been wrenched around and, and looks very different. It's easy to, to go, oh, this is, this is doomsday because it's never happened before. It's unprecedented. Uh, to use everybody's favorite word. Um, yeah. But really, it is precedented in the sense that right from the beginning, right from Peter and John, there has been this struggle, this tension between following Christ and, and being religious and going, they're not the same thing. And we've got to we've got to um, we've got to realize that this is nothing new and God is not taken off guard by this. I think that's that's helpful for me and, and calming for me. Another thing I would say is that it means we need to double down on the center. Um, you know, what? Look, it's, it's interesting what they prayed and asked God for here of, of how to respond to this. They said, and now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with complete boldness. As you stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. In other words... This, this conflict that's happening, they, they place in God's care and they say, we're going to be about what it is you've put us here to do, which is to bear witness to the resurrection of Jesus. We're not going to get all uh, wound up around figuring things out with, with these priests over here. We're, we're not going to. We're not going to get distracted and get pour all our energy into defending ourselves or battling for our rights or uh, making putting them in their place. We're, we're going to stay the course and get uh, really keep everything focused on on just a bolder witness than ever to to the cross and the resurrection. And by that, I don't mean that we just like close our eyes to everything that's going on, and and you know, I'm only gonna I'm only gonna talk about the cross, and so therefore, we're we're just not gonna deal with problems in the world. I think it's more going. This is the big corrective for us in our thinking that that we are the cross is our lens through looking at. It's like we did in our last series, saying you know. This, this is the, the way that we interpret everything um, in a different light. Does that, does that make sense? There's a difference between just kind of ignoring, bearing, putting our head in the sand and acting like it doesn't exist. I think we have to acknowledge. They acknowledge that, hey, there's a problem here, Lord, and these threats are real, but we're going we're gonna to give it to your care and... Um, Respond by being bolder in our witness. Um, and I think that's a corrective for us in a few different ways. I'm curious if, if there's a way in your mind when you think about focusing on the cross, how that adjusts relating to other problems. How does that, how does that help us without just being like unrelated? Yeah, Carrie? Yeah, I just feel like the beauty of being somebody who's looking towards the cross if that's what we're all doing, it puts us all in the same place. Yes. There's no longer this elevated way of, like, I'm speaking from this elevated yes. place. We can speak with a confidence and, a, and ask God to help us be bold. But I love the last part of that verse because it's, it's God who will stretch out his yes. and heal and perform signs and wonders. That's not our job. Right. And so I think it's cool for us to think of having to always come back. Yeah. looking at the world through the cross and knowing this is not a surprise to God does something to us yes. rather than, Lord, take care of them right. for all their wrong things. Yes, yes, you yes. <laughs> exactly. It gets rid of our smugness, I think, in some ways. Yeah, I think that is exactly right. I don't think you can look at the cross for very long <laughs> and stay in that place of arrogance or pride or 
uh, belligerence or hate even or uh, like that all gets shifted for us the longer we're we're looking at the cross and then then we can engage in the world differently i think it it uh, exposes us when we go to the cross and it comforts us also when we go to the cross it strengthens us it frees us it um you know, when we when we see the forgiveness that's there, it's easier for us to offer forgiveness. Um, and it just it just brings it just pulls us up short when we are the ones who are not in the right. Uh, we're, we're constantly brought back to to our need for grace. Yeah, Ron, were you going to say something? Well, I was going to say that uh, the longer I'm a Christian, the less judgmental I feel. And the only way I can reach anybody anyway is through the love of Christ. Mm -hmm. you know, all the other stuff is, you know, lots of deaths. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think um, they were, they had every opportunity to make the question be about who's right here. And that's the temptation always to go, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to choose to distance myself from this because they're not quite right, you know? Uh, and it becomes a, a degree of correctness that gets tighter and tighter in our little circle. Instead, we can just say, where's Jesus? I'm going to be with him. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on what he's focused on, pour my energies there, and, and then let the what's, what's right emerge um, out of that. The final, the final piece that I think they focused on was um, choosing love over fear. I, I, love, I love the very last verse that we read about this. It says, And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. Um, they were doing such a great job of caring for one another's needs and ministering to each other and loving one another. That was... That was their emphasis more than going, what are we going to do about these authorities? You know, what are, and, and, and they really um, poured their energies into good care for each other. And I think that's so, so good. Um, back when Karen and I were in college, and I think I've shared this story before, but they were in the process of... Um, building not very far from where we went to school, they were building the what at the time was the world's largest Buddhist temple outside of Thailand, um, and we we actually got to go tour it at one point, and it was it was crazy. It was like walking into the Forbidden City. It was so big, and um, felt like you were just in a different in a different world. But as it was being built. Um, there was a Chinese church that was very concerned about it coming into this community. And so they were down at the bottom of the hill picketing while it was, was being built. And they're out there every day with their signs walking back and forth. And, you know, it's Southern California. It's hot out there. It's, it's warm. And uh, one day, some monks came down from this complex and uh, came down to them and they said, it's hot out here. You must be thirsty. Uh, we brought you some Cokes. And talk about a, a humbling story of going, wow, um, choosing love over fear, going, how, how might the church and I, I don't mean to disparage this church for, for their deep desire for uh, communicating truth, but I just go, um, the love is, is the better way here. And you go, if their concern is for these monks and other people who will come there, how, how, how might they, they show that in another way? Or did we, learn, did we lose... That's okay. That was my last slide anyway. So you're good, except, uh, except for the closing song here. But, um, yeah, you know, uh, I, I want to I wanna lean towards love. 
Um, and my tendency is to lean towards who's right. And um, so I, I, I just, as we are going forward, figuring out as a church community who we're going to be, uh, to go, let's, let's follow Jesus. Let's look for where he is. Let's care for one another well. And, uh, and he will show us what's right and, and lead the way forward as we follow him and keep our, keep our focus on him. Well, let's pray. Uh, God, these are, these are weighty things to consider. Um, and I know even talking about them can be unsettling as we acknowledge and recognize that things that we felt were uh, stable or where we felt we uh, knew at least where your people were at any given time, uh, they feel like sometimes the rug has been pulled out. We're not sure what what's happening, and that can be alarming. And um, and yet, God, none of this is outside of your vision and your control. And I praise you for that. I thank you that we can always come back to the fact that you are the creator of it all. That you uh, you see us. And, um, and God, uh, you're going to get us through. And, um, and Jesus, you haven't left us. So when we look for you, we can find you because you are right here among us. And so give us eyes to see. And um, God, give us, give us hearts uh, to love and to act on that love um, so that even our, even our care for one another bears witness to the resurrection. It's in your name we pray. Amen.